evolved on land, lobsters in the sea, but there is a genetic connection. An enormous diversity of life as we see it on Earth. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. The evidence is growing that nature reuses the same genetic tools over and over again in all species. Not only is our genetic material shared with everything from a fruit fly to a butterfly, but even sea creatures, like the lobster. Researcher Nepom Patel at the University of Chicago has been studying how crustaceans, like lobsters, shrimp, and even sand fleas, are continually evolving as nature finds new ways to use their genetic material. Like Sean Carroll's butterflies, these creatures, which all belong to the arthropod family, have developed pretty amazing diversity among their own kind. Our main focus is understanding how they generate segments, which we know that they all do and that that comes from a common ancestor that they had, and then how they specialize their appendages because it's these appendages or arms as, as that they have that makes them so successful. We're interested in the genes that allow them to specialize these different appendages to do different things. Arthropods have very unique body types. First, they wear their skeleton on the outside, an exoskeleton. This makes it easy to see how their body is divided into repeating segments. So if humans share most of the same genes as all living creatures, including these tasty fellows, how do the genes that create segments in the arthropods correlate in humans? So if you think of something like a millipede or a centipede that you see walking on the ground, you can see that it's made of repeating patterns. And those are the segments, the body segments. And usually most arthropods have a pair of appendages on each of those segments. We have an internal skeleton, so it's a little harder to see the repeating patterns that we have. But they're visible, for example, in the pattern of ribs that we have. It's a theme that biology uses over and over again. What fascinated Dr. Patel was how each creature's existing genes express themselves in new ways. This reinvention helps each animal develop the specialized appendages it needs to adapt to its own unique environment. It's believed that in the sort of most primitive type of crustacean that existed hundreds of millions of years ago, that most all of the appendages of the thorax were all the same and they were used for swimming. These are crustaceans called artemia, or brine shrimp. They're actually the thing that you see on the back of comic books called sea monkeys. And they represent what we believe is a very ancient body plant for the crustaceans. The appendages are actually all the same. So they have exactly the same shape and they're used for the same thing. They're used for the animal to swim. But then as evolution proceeded and the crustaceans diverged and evolved, some of the crustaceans specialized their appendages sort of up near the head to actually use them for feeding as well. So how has evolution helped some of these animals to specialize their body segments? Dr. Patel shows us some intriguing examples that demonstrate how these insects of the sea have developed in so many diverse ways. So here we have a, a crustacean that's familiar to everyone, a lobster. And this is an example where several of these thoracic segments have been modified to, for use in feeding. So with something like a lobster, you have the ability to walk away, snap at, it, snap at something, tear up the food and eat it all at once. So this is a stomatopod, a really amazing group of crustaceans. And they're uh, quite beautiful, but actually very powerful. So they actually have this ability to strike with these front appendages and to actually kill their prey or defend themselves or break things with them. Patel and his co-workers have identified one of the areas on the genome responsible for the segmentation. So one of the, the best examples is a set of genes called the homeotic genes or the Hox genes. And this is a complex of genes that's found actually in all animals. And what it does is control what we call regionalization of the animal. It makes different parts of the body different from one another. So I have a brine shrimp that's stained with UVX. Yeah, it looks pretty good. So you can see it perfectly correlates with where the change in the limb morphology is. In the lab, Dr. Patel has been researching a specific Hox gene called ultrabithorax or UBX. By examining when and where that gene is turned on and off during development, 
the researchers have discovered an important clue to how these creatures reuse the same genes to create appendages which serve different purposes. It turns out these genes also link pretty directly to humans. These homeotic genes are expressed at very different positions along the body, and that controls then the types of appendages they have a little bit later when they develop in this embryo and ultimately in the adult. But it turns out that in vertebrates, the genes are used in very similar ways. In humans, the UBX gene appears to control how our spine develops, just like a lobster's body develops in segments. We're segmented too, but it isn't as obvious. Our Hitchhiker's Guide to the Genome is ready, I'm sure, to tell us more. Lucky, you're a human. You're an animal, a vertebrate animal. The human spine is made up of 33 bony segments, specialized into five different types of vertebrae. Cervical vertebrae are flexible, but strong enough to hold up the head. Thoracic vertebrae are designed to hold more weight and attach to the ribs. Lumbar vertebrae are responsible for holding up the majority of body weight. Sacral vertebrae are compressed and fused together for support. And coccygeal vertebrae form the tail-like bone at the base of the spine. So just like our cousins, the crustaceans, that use the UBX gene to specialize appendages, humans use the UBX family of genes to specialize our vertebrae. And this gives us a really, I think, an increasingly clear understanding of how it is that evolution has taken a, probably a relatively simple organism that existed hundreds of millions of years ago and then generated an enormous diversity of life as we see it on Earth. And it's remarkable to think that that's happened from, you know, a common set of rules and of genes that existed. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.